With more than 6,000 small and micro-cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple, at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to the C-Suite series presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC-registered FINRA licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. Today's interview features Encore Energy, OTC ticker symbol ENCUF, TSXV ticker symbol EU. Noble Senior Research Analyst Michael Heim interviews Encore Energy CEO Paul Gorenson and Executive Chairman William Sheriff. Visit ChannelCheck.com or click the link in the description for Michael's research on Encore Energy, as well as news and advanced market data. And now, here's Michael, Paul, and William. I want to take a second to thank everyone for joining us today. Today we have Bill Sheriff, Chairman of the Board of Encore Energy, and Paul Gorenson, who's the CEO of the company, having joined just last fall. We're going to jump right into the questions, and Paul, I'm going to start with you. Encore has recently acquired uranium assets and has been very upfront about its desire to aggregate more assets under the belief that uranium prices will rise. Why do you see uranium prices rising from their current spot levels that are a little bit below $30 a pound? Well, we're seeing a lot of things happening in the market today. Uh, some of the more recent news that's come out is that actually producers are actually purchasing uranium uh, that uh, could create, that's going to create a, a tightness in the market. Uh, that will drive should begin to drive prices as more uh, uh, more uh, demand approaches the market. Uh, we see the utilities uh, have been stating publicly, as well as uh, even in conversations directly with our company, that they're pretty. They're even though they're pretty covered for now. Starting in 2023, they're have, showing significant uncovered quantities that they need to start acquiring. And we have this fundamental uh, basis in the market that uh, supply is not at the same level as it needs to be to meet the future demand. When I talk about future demand, I'm looking more at that 2023 and beyond with window. And, uh, <clears throat> and as a result, uh, we see that there's gonna be sustained, there's gonna be sustained uh, support for increased prices. Uh, we know that there are other producers that are as stated they're gonna be purchasing, that's Cameco and Kazatom Prompt, just to meet their sales agreements. Others are doing this as a means to uh, have strategic uh, inventories uh, to either hedge or to uh, de-risk future production opportunities. So we, we see everything building to improving pricing, and we see that helps support our strategy, both from a production strategy as well as potential of uh, continuing to aggregate assets as we move forward. You mentioned the producers building up their inventory in this morning. Another large U.S. producer, Energy Fuels, said the, the exact same thing. Uh, they kind of talked about the importance of building a natural reserve of uranium. Is that something that you think will kickstart things? Yeah, it will. So the there, there's a couple of things that are happening on that end. First of all, in the case of uh, companies such as Energy Fuels, they already have uh, a, a rather, rather large inventory as working capital, and they they intend they've stated they've intended to add to that uh, to better build their strat strategic uh, 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 reserve in their own place. And then also we've got the U.S. government that's looking to also acquire uranium uh, sometime in early 2022. We expect uh, they've stated it'll start in court, uh, Q uh, or fiscal year 2022. And uh, right now that's scheduled to be about 75 million pounds of uranium, uh, not 75 million pounds, I correct that please. That's uh, $75 million worth of uranium. And at today's prices, uh, <clears throat> that is uh, about what, two and a half million pounds or so, maybe more, or actually, yeah. And uh, so it's not gonna be a big amount, but it's a continuous draw on demand. And, and draw on inventories. And as we see less supply coming into the market, 
those who have inventories will be effectively the first movers when the market begins to uh, become more demand-based rather than supply-based. If prices do rise, do you think there will be a supply response? You talked about the inventories, but looking beyond that, are there, are there new sources of supply that you think will open up? There always is, but the, the real catch is, will it be in time? There's always significant lead times, and most of the new supply will be coming from new mines. And it always takes, it as regardless whether you're in, in an in situ recovery or you're in uh, conventional mining, there is a lead time that one has to go through to, to get production response. Uh, you know, a good example, if one goes back to 2005 and 2006, when the prices really began to move, there wasn't a significant production response, particularly in the U.S. or even in the Western world, uh, simply because the projects were not in place to get kicked off. Most of them are not even uh, capable of producing until well after the peak of the prices. Now, that doesn't count for uh, what we saw coming out of Kazakhstan with Kazadam Prom's uh, government-supported building program. Uh, that was where the primary uh, source of production, new production response was. Uh, but let's keep in mind is that the, uh, even the Kazakhs have said that uh, for what they see as a future expected demand over the next uh, 10 years, there's going to have to be two more Kazakhstans that are going to have to come into production in order to meet that future demand. And uh, and so being able to ramp up and get to that point, it's going to be significant prices. Are going to, prices are going to increase significantly to incentivize new production. And that is uh, that's the key. Is that uh, today's spot prices? Are we seeing any new production come online? No. And uh, and we see all we've seen really is production, uh, primary production being closed and decommissioned, or being placed on uh, indefinite standby pending new prices. So obviously we're not at that price point to draw in new production. And uh, most people, most public companies are stating that they need prices well above 40 to $45 a pound uh, to begin thinking about bringing on new production. Bill, let me bring you into the conversation. So if we do see a rise in your annual prices, what makes Encore Energy, in, what makes them in a good position to react? Well, I think the uh, you know the key to uh, this really goes back to your last question. That's production and and new production. And when we entered the market, uh, you know we've been around for ten years, but we've been uh, more or less in uh, hibernation until just uh, well, actually the last twelve months or so. And once we could see the metrics uh, changing from headwinds on the prices to tailwinds, and in fact, uh, uh, you know a, a real profound case for higher prices starting uh, you know in 2022, 2023, significantly higher than they are now. Uh, then the first thing we did to uh, to, to venture into the, the, oh, I guess, renaissance of our company was to acquire two production plants. And these are licensed, permitted uh, plants. There are 11 of them in the country. We have two of them for in situ. Our focus is entirely on in situ. And, and to a large degree, that's because of the exact factors that you're talking about is responsiveness to the market. Uh, the in situ does not take anywhere near the lead time of a conventional mining project in general, certainly not a sizable one. Um, you know, permitting reclamation all, all like considerably easier. Uh, it's it, it's something that in, in the states anyway, a lot of it depends on what state you're in. And Texas uh, is certainly one of the two uh, major states that you want to be in in terms of uh, responsive uh, regulatory regime, uh, getting things done in a timely manner. Uh, but clearly, having those production assets puts us uh, you know four or five years at least ahead of the curve in terms of if you were to decide to go out and build an ISL plant from scratch. Uh, you know, aside from the 30 or 40 million CapEx required, uh, conceivably more depending on size, you've got a five-year time lag of, of permitting. And uh, the permitting is not without a cost, nor is the simple GNA of remaining in business that long and retaining shareholder interest. Uh, you know, th these are all problematic. So having those as a head start really puts us, you know, at the starting line for the, the next big move in uranium. Okay. And uh, it's a unique advantage and, and one that uh, coupled with the... Uh, you know, quicker responsiveness of the ISL in itself uh, positions us very well. Paul, oh, processing the uh, uranium resources is an important part of, of the process. Explain the steps that Encore has taken to restart the processing plants it acquired at the end of last year. Sure. The, uh, well, first thing we're doing right now is we're going through a capital uh, asset uh, review of the, starting with Rosita, because that's the one that we see is the, the closest to being production capable. So we're currently uh, 
sizing and making sure the equipment we have in place is going to work uh, right now. The good news is good. And so we're, we're moving forward. We expect to start executing sometime in the second quarter with uh, beginning to do uh, the, the actual construction work. Uh, we expect to get done within the next 12 months. And we think it's going to cost us to refurbish Rosita less than a million bucks in a, less than 12 months to get that done. We're also doing some work uh, to begin developing our well fields to get ready for production. We started uh, uh, permitting uh, for our exploration permits. So we can actually start uh, putting some drill work, rigs to work to do uh, mineral assessments to improve from historic resources to uh, 4301 uh, compliant resources. Uh, principally at our Butler Ranch property we brought brought in with the acquisition. We're also in the process of doing additional land uh, acquisitions uh, with no mineral resources so that they can also be provided feed into uh, Rosita. We expect the next, when we do begin to put in well fields, we expect that to add another $5 million of uh, cost uh, to get that into production readiness. And uh, actually that would be to get it into commercial production, significantly lower to make it ready uh, to begin to develop for production. But we hope to have all this done in place within the next 12 to eight month, 18 months so that uh, we can be prepared for the next uh, product, you know, when the market tells us it's time. And that's, we believe that what we're seeing, as I mentioned earlier, is that what we're seeing in the market based on what we're hearing from utilities and other, other uh, sources is that our timing is going to be in, in good sync with what we see the market doing. And then, Bill, you also have some uranium assets in New Mexico. If prices really take off, talk about the long-term plans for Encore. I will. Encore has been uh, built uh, with uh, basically three strategy, three a three-tier strategy in mind. That's short-term, mid-term, and and long-term. Uh, we we have a short-term, uh, you know, in, in hand with the two two of eleven production plants in in the country there in Texas and. Uh, efforts underway to modernize uh, them uh, with Rosita being first, as Paula talked about. <laughs> that, that sees us through the first part. The midterm, we're, we're still addressing and hopefully we'll be able to uh, fill in with uh, mergers and acquisitions, which have been a main part, mainstay of uh, the group's history over the past, uh, well, even going back through the last fuel cycle, uh, back in the uh, late 04 to 08 timeframe. But uh, the, the real long-term value of the company is in New Mexico. And New Mexico, uh, while it hasn't had much uh, production of, of late or in the last uh, fuel cycle, it historically is the richest and largest of all the uranium districts in the U.S. And uh, we, we see that returning to its prominence over the course of uh, you know, the, the long term here. And we, we measure that in terms of five years plus. Uh, the big issue with it uh, is, is uh, simply that uh, some of the mining that was done in the past uh, during the 40s, 50s and 60s was uh, not done uh, maybe to the highest of social uh, standards. And, uh, and and even environmental standards in some instances. So, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, we've had a, a pretty good track record in other companies uh, dealing with Aboriginal issues and, and affected communities issues and uh, bringing, really bringing all the stakeholders along with us uh, where it makes sense for everybody. And uh, that New Mexico will be no different for us. It uh, isn't gonna happen overnight. Uh, as I say, we're, we're addressing a five-year time frame to it. Uh, we, we think that, uh, uh, that's a reasonable time, and a good portion of that will be education in terms of how in situ leaching is different or in situ recovery uh, is different than uh, the conventional mining that uh, most of the folks there are familiar with. Um, you know, vastly environmentally superior, uh, much quicker, et cetera, and not, doesn't carry the the health concerns that uh, you know, some of the practices in the past did. Uh, and and we've really evolved, uh, you know, dr dramatically since most of the mines in, in those earlier decades. Uh, in addition, we plan to provide, uh, you know, a bit more benefit to the community than a gazebo in the park and a few jobs, which has been, the, you know, the standard throughout uh, time for, for mining companies. And, and we're going to really find ways to work with the uh, community and, and actually build careers and, uh, you know, some sweat equity in the projects so that they actually benefit from the projects. And uh, we think that will uh, change the tide and, and actually make us welcome in the communities and, and the industry welcome. And uh, you know, it, it, it's the, why we've got such a large endowment there. We've got over 100 million pounds of historic resources, including about 32 million 43101 uh, at Crown Point. And I'd mention that those are about two thirds permitted under NRC permits as we speak. But here again, we aren't trying to rush out and, and work on it or even our uh, Juan Tafoya Marquez deposit, which is on a Spanish land grant. 
which is uh, probably the best title you can get in the U.S. in terms of mineral uh, title. But we aren't trying to rush out and get it done. Um, more, we're trying to establish that good fundamental base of support in the community before we attempt it. But the prize is certainly worth it. We think the uh, fuel cycle that we're in now is going to be quite different than the last one. The last one was meteoric in its rise, but very short-lived. And we think this one's going to be uh, a decade or more, perhaps the most stable environment for nuclear power that we've seen since its invention. And uh, with that in mind, we don't need $100 plus prices. You know, we need 50 to $100 range over uh, the course of a decade or something. And you can really build uh, significant shareholder equity through production. And that's exactly our goal. And why New Mexico is such a you know, big part of the, uh, uh, of the triad, if you will, short, medium and long term. So we've talked about bringing uh, some of the Texas plants up and running. We've talked about maybe making acquisitions. We've talked about longer term plans of developing New Mexico. These things all cost money. You've got a clean balance sheet to start with, but how do you see financing all these acquisitions, all this financial spending? Thanks. I mean, that's that's a good point. And like I say, we do have a head start. We've got uh, 20 million Canadian in the in the till at the moment. Obviously, we have some reclamation ongoing, um, which will release bond money to come back in, but but that'll have to be replaced on other uh, projects as we move into production. So it's a short-term cash flow gain, but uh, the 20 million that's there is, is certainly not going to be the end, you know, be all end all for for the next uh, growth cycle. But it should be, uh, you know, roughly enough to get us to that first level of of production. You know, Paul had mentioned a million dollar refurb on the first plant, five million dollars on the uh, well field, roughly, and uh, and then of course we'll be spending a few million here and there uh, doing PEAs or upgrading other historical resources to to standards. And, and ultimately, uh, you know, looking at the Kingsville plant and bringing it up. So clearly there's uh, no shortage of places to spend money, but uh, not having to deal with that big CapEx on your first plant is a huge benefit for us. Not having to deal with the five years or, or thereabouts of, of permitting and carrying salaries and burn rates while you're getting to the starting line. These are really huge benefits for us. We're, we are at the starting line. You know, we're within 12 months of the starting line with a relatively low cash burn to get there. So a clear advantage there. You know, when you look at M and A, uh, which obviously we've we've talked a lot about, uh, both in this forum and others, uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a, a question mark because you don't know what what exactly is going to develop there in terms of opportunity or in terms of resources within the companies that you might end up uh, uh, acquiring or, or merging with. Uh, it may very well be a cash, uh, you know, a bit of a cash hoard on on the side of the company you're taking, which would obviously benefit plans may also be the other way around where you've got great assets and not much cash so you would need to go out and, and raise some money to, to move those forward but uh you know as being a large shareholder in the company we're, we're pretty keen on not uh, diluting the company and anything we look to do will be accretive in, in terms of uh, opportunity and near-term cash flow so uh, got a great start like i say it's uh, i don't think you can ever have quote enough money but uh, we've certainly got uh, enough to uh, you know take it take us past the, finish, the start line Terrific. Well, it sounds like you're in a good position to take advantage of any rise in uranium prices. We just need those prices to start rising. Wanted to uh, thank uh, Bill Sheriff and Paul Gorenson for uh, participating in this. Well, Mike, I learned a lot about uranium. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, management seen that the prospective rebound in uranium prices might last a while. In fact, they even said it could last decades, uh, given the push for green energy and so forth. I was just wondering, um, what are your thoughts about uranium pricing and does it look sustainable in terms of a recovery that could last many years as management seems to think? Always hard to predict where prices are gonna go, but I, I do think there's a good chance this could be much more sustainable than past peaks. And the reason I say that is because we've gone through an extended period of low prices now, and we're seeing that the exploration companies are not spending the money they need to explore. We've talked to several of these smaller explorer exploration companies and they talk about needing a sustained period of in the 40 to $50 before they'll even start to do some drilling on properties. And once, and there's about a five to 10 year lag between when they start drilling and when it can reach production. So yes, this could very well be a long extended up cycle. And you uh, touched on this, uh, but the management team seems to uh, think that they are very responsive to react to the demand very quickly. And how do you be believe this company is um, res you know, responsive relative to its peers? Well, uh, the company touched on it a little bit, but uh, 
they have control of the process called in situ recovery, which is basically they bleed uh, chemicals down to recover. So we don't have to go through the lengthy uh, open mining or, or underground mining. And that just gets things up and quicker. Uh, but it does require more processing. And they have control of two of, uh, I believe he said, only seven uh, in situ processing plants. And those are in Texas and they're already permitted. So, you know, when they say they can get one of those plants up and running in uh, a year or two, uh, you know, I think they can. And uh, that's in stark contrast to what some other companies can do. And Mike, the management team here seems very knowledgeable. What are your thoughts about the ability of this management team to execute on this strategy? Well, they're very open about their uh, interest in aggregating uh, assets. Uh, and they've done it before. Uh, uh, Bill Sheriff uh, uh, put together a whole bunch of uh, uranium companies uh, back around uh, 2009, right when the, we had the last peak and sold it for $1.8 billion. Um, so he certainly got the uh, pedigree to put the to be the one that is the aggregator and um, and the openness and the willingness to do it again this period. As I said, at the end, all we really need is for uranium prices to start going up. And Mike, when is the best time to actually invest in a uranium company? I mean, it, do you think it's six to twelve months in advance to seeing prices type uh, you know type start to rise, or or is it? the market kind of react to when prices start to rise? What are, what are your thoughts about that? Well, that, that's a very good question. Obviously, it's, it's hard to predict when uh, uranium prices uh, might rise, but as the management pointed out, we're going through a period where the utilities are not locking in contracts and the producers are not uh, willing to sell at these type of prices. So I have a feeling when prices start to rise, they will rise quickly. What we see in the stock prices is a very quick reaction. Any hint that pricing is going up and the, and the stocks do really well. So it's been a period of head fakes, head fakes, and eventually at one point it'll be a real rise in prices and the head fakes won't be head fakes, they will be long-term shooting up in stock price. So when I think it's good to not try and play the game of trying to time when things go up because they just move too, too quick, um, think about this as uh, we don't know when they're going to rise, but we expect them to rise within the by the next 12 to 24 months, and certainly it's time to get in those stocks before you see that. Thank you for joining us for this C-Suite interview presentation brought to you by Channel Check. Visit our YouTube channel for more interview content, as well as virtual roadshows and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and micro cap companies listed.